welcome to this week's episode of the Cricket Her Weekly. We are actually recording this on a Friday to go out on Sunday. So if any huge cricketing event happens in the next uh, 48 hours or so, then we'll just have to cover it next week, Sid. <laughs> um, but there has been a few pieces of big news this week. And one of the biggest has been that cricket, men's and women's, is going to be in the Olympics. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, you know, well, OK, they still haven't 100% confirmed it's going to be in. OK. Um, but it, it, it's like it's got to pretty much the last stage. So, right. um, OK. You know, there's the, the recommendation is that it be in. Some of the news reports actually were a bit odd because there's, there's, there's a couple of other sports that are in a similar bucket to cricket. And basically the news reports went, cricket is definitely in, but these other sports like squash, for example, may or may not be. And it's like, well, actually, technically, they're all in the same in the same boat. So they've still got to be voted on. Right. But basically, the recommendation is that they get, they're okay. going to go ahead. And so the cricket is, is going to be is almost certainly going to be in. A, it's not for quite a while though, is it, Raph? It's not until LA twenty eight. So it's yeah. Los Angeles in um, two thousand and twenty eight. Yeah. Is so it's the next but five years. Yeah. Time. So it's the next but one Olympics because obviously everything has to be planned for ahead of time. I was just going to say that the process is not hugely transparent about exactly how they kind of go about admitting new sports but anyway it looks like cricket is going to be in so I'm quite excited actually but Sid um, you did write a piece for the website this week about cricket being in the Olympics um, which was it was a really good piece and very thought-provoking so those of us who are kind of jumping up and down in our chairs with excitement about the thought of cricket being in the Olympics you you slightly tempered that excitement didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've, I've become a little bit sceptical. I think part of the reason I've become a little bit sceptical is because it's, it's still like unclear why the ICC suddenly changed their minds like this. So for, mm -hmm. for, for years, the ICC very much armed and heard about it and were like, oh, we're not sure about this. And then suddenly they've decided this is a good idea. It's possible, possible that they see it as related to the introduction of this Major League Cricket, this big franchise tournament, which is at the moment only a men's tournament that they've... Um, got running they're trying to get up and running in the united states mm -hmm. we've had one edition of it obviously they're hoping that there'll be more to come so it's possibly related to that whatever the icc so have been persuaded now i think it's widely known um isn't it that the bcci have been one of the kind of key thorns in the side of the icc um wanting cricket to be in the olympics and supporting cricket being in the olympics so it's not necessarily the icc who have changed their minds it's perhaps the, the bcci who obviously a lot of the shots nowadays yeah so the, the and the icc there you know the, their big thing is that this is going to kind of put cricket in a, in a new light they say it's going to be the biggest tournament that, that these players have ever ever yeah, played the, 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 the players platform will... to shine to yeah. Barkley. yeah now that's it for itself a little bit <laughs> isn't your own world cup the ultimate platform to shine no I've got a thought, no Sid, it's the olympics not. Um, so um you know and it, it's clear that, that most of the icc's arguments uh kind of range around this the, the idea that it will turn cricket into a bigger sport it will act as a marketing tool and a promotional tool for, for the game worldwide and the, the game in the united states where the icc is pushing hard and where women's cricket to be fair has got a big opportunity mm. um, because of the way that baseball kind of treats women's baseball or softball is essentially women's baseball basically i mean the pedants will tell me that it's not but basically softball is women's baseball okay. that the way that that's treated in the united states does represent an opportunity for cricket um but I just think we need to be a little bit sceptical that this is going to be any kind of game change. You know, again, as we saw at the Commonwealth Games, even even at the Commonwealth Games, right, cricket was not the primary sport. Right, athletics is the primary sport at all of these events, and it's the athletics where all the focus is going to be. So, you know, in terms of the TV coverage that we like to see in this country, in England, for example, the BBC no longer has full coverage of the Olympics. They've kind of um, financial reasons have forced them to, you know, go into partnership with, I believe, the Discovery Channel. Um, don't quote me on that, but they've gone into partnership with a commercial channel. Uh, and that means that the BBC aren't going to show every event. And when it comes to deciding what they're going to show in their limited you know, capacity to show things, they're obviously going to show the athletics first. They're going to show the gymnastics before that, because the gymnastics is the other huge sport from the Olympic perspective. So there's an awful lot of other sports in the queue ahead of cricket. Cricket is not going to be front and centre of these Olympic Games. The media coverage is really interesting um, because actually... Cricket usually um, is covered 
well, from, from our perspective, is usually covered by Test Match Special, a kind of specialist team of reporters who report on cricket, and that's their only job. And actually, the idea that the BBC will be able to afford to send the entire TMS team, or any of the TMS team, out to cover just the cricket in the Olympics doesn't seem very realistic. Um, no, and again, from, those things are going to cost a lot yeah, of money to do. And from the, my know, perspective, will I actually be, will I be able to get any work covering women's cricket? In the Olympics, it doesn't seem very likely because it's just this one, um, this one event in a much bigger event where a lot of the media focus is going to be on other. On yeah, other taking place in one of the most expensive cities in the world, where the, yeah. the rates for hotel rooms are going to be astronomical and things like that. So it's not going to get that same detailed specialist coverage that it that it would usually get. So there's, there's a few reasons to be skeptical about it. But Raf, you know, we need to put some positives on there as well. What are the positives? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great opportunity for women's cricket in the US, isn't it? Um, well, cricket in the US, but obviously we're specifically focused on women's cricket to uh, capture that market. Um, and just by virtue of being part of the Olympics, you will get people in the US tuning in um, and, and showing up who have never watched cricket before um, and will be exposed to it in a way that they wouldn't have been otherwise. And so, so I think there are like, positives. You know, the, the sports channels will have, here's an introduction to cricket, here's, here's how to yeah, follow cricket exactly, on the Olympics. Exactly, exactly. A, like, a little bit like during the Commonwealth Games, there will have been people who went to see the lawn bowls who would never ever normally go and watch lawn bowls um, and you know, therefore might have learned something about that particular sport. Um, and so, so there is definitely an exposure element to it. But of course, the, the big caveat to that is that it's... Um, it's only going to be a six-team competition, which is something else that you discussed in your piece, isn't it, Sid? Um, and it's an interesting one because all of the talk about the Olympics has been as it being this kind of big expansion opportunity for women's cricket and, and men's cricket as well. Um, and that it's really exciting for kind of um, some of the, um, the lower ranked nations but they're not even going to get a looking because it's just going to be purely the, the top six, six ranked nations. Now, I suspect what's happened there is that the ICC has had to massively compromise um, in terms of the, it's in its conversations with the IOC because the IOC has to think uh, logistically, how are we going to fit in a cricket competition into an already heaving Olympic schedule? How are we going to fit in all of those 15 team um, 15 person cricket teams into our Olympic village and everything like that so the compromise is where well, we have a six team tournament um, at the Commonwealth Games we had an eight team tournament and there were teams who just missed out that were really disappointed and that's going to be kind of mirrored in this situation isn't it? So yeah definitely and not you know as well as that you know it's it's already been made pretty clear that the you know, the, between them, the ICC and the, the, you know, the people behind the scenes at the Olympics must have pretty much told that the Indian authorities and the Team GB authorities that yes, England and India in particular will definitely be in, we will, whatever it takes. Now, technically, there's going to be a qualification process. What's that qualification process? Well, it's the ICC rankings. How are the ICC rankings calculated, Mr. ICC? Oh, I'm very sorry, we can't tell you that because of commercial confidence. <laughs> it's a special algorithm. So, what yeah. clearly they're, they're they're setting themselves up so that if because obviously the people there'll be there'll be a date right, and they'll say on this date the rankings yeah. determine whether or not you qualify for the Olympic Games. Yeah. Clearly, the chief executive of the ICC and all those top people will be given a heads up several days before that date of which teams are going to qualify and I can absolutely guarantee you that if India are not in that top six in both the men's and the women's events the programmers will be told to go away and come up with a different answer to the secret ranking algorithm that puts India back in the... so that means there is zero chance of even some of the some of the better non-top six teams like Ireland you know breaking through into that kind of thing it makes about... it difficult for teams like the West Indies as well because yeah. You know, they won't necessarily be there, and, if, and you know, the, because the, of the however hard you fight, in the back of your mind is going to be, yeah, but if we if we overtake India in the rankings, then the ICC are just going to cook the rankings, and that's just so disappointing from a competition perspective. Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful what we say, obviously, because um, that's your that's your theory, but we don't have any actual evidence of, about them cooking the algorithm, do we? No. Okay. Good. Um, you're talking about England as being one of the teams, but of course it's not going to be England, is it? It's going to be Team GB. Yeah, and again, and this is, this this is, is very interesting because that means that it should be the best Scottish women's cricketers um, and 
potentially the best Northern Irish women's cricketers playing in that Team GB, right? Yeah, in theory. I mean, um, someone was saying to me that apparently in the rugby, um, in terms of the rugby sevens, the Northern Irish players were told that they were they were going to play for the Republic of Ireland in the rugby sevens competition. So I kind of probably the same thing would happen with cricket because obviously the Northern Irish players currently do play for Ireland in cricket. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean. You know, are the Scottish players even going to be a looking? We, we, we saw, you know, on Twitter this week, everyone going, oh, we're so excited that Ben Stokes is going to be playing. I mean, <laughs> well, whether Ben Stokes will still be playing for England at that point anyway, yeah. who knows? I mean, he's, he's kind of hobbling around the Men's World Cup at the moment. Um, but, you know, it's like, it seems to be a foregone conclusion that it will be ben, it'll be the England captain, whoever they are, Ben Stokes, you know, Grace Scribbins, who will be leading out that team. And it shouldn't really be that foregone conclusion. It should be a, a British team that includes you know, representatives from, you know, the whole of these Absolutely. islands. Because otherwise it's, it's not the Olympics. I mean, it's like, but the, the ice, obviously the authorities want to have their cake and eat it and they shall have cake and they shall eat cake. <laughs> okay. Anyway. But I am really excited to see women's cricket in the Olympics. I'm just putting it out there for all of these caveats, for all of these things that we've talked about that are less positive aspects of it. How brilliant is it going to be when we sit down to watch the opening ceremony for LA 2028 and all the women cricketers are there and um, we get to see the coverage of women's cricket in the Olympics. I'm, I'm kind of excited. Good. Awesome. <laughs> now, um, well, I was going to say close to home, in fact, equally not, far from it's home. not close to home um, at all. All, so. all the way across in Mumbai. Uh, we mentioned a few weeks ago that you know John Lewis, the England coach, said he was going to have a special batting camp um, in Mumbai. Yeah. Um, and that camp is uh, going ahead as we speak. Um, our secret spies have been on the lookout <laughs> for us and have reported back to us the the England players that have flown off to the batting camp because the England themselves have announced nothing about this. There's been no official press release no, or anything like that. Nothing. What what have your secret spies told you, Raf? Well, just want to say thank you very much to Jadeja, who um, has actually pointed this out to us um, on, on Twitter, um, flagged up that um, it's actually on Alice Capsi's social media. So I don't know about social spies, but you've got to be pretty savvy and be keeping up with everybody's social media, um, that Alice Capsi's photos have made it clear which players are at this batting camp in Mumbai. Now, obviously, some of them are... Um, going to be going off to, to WBBL um, and some have indeed already gone perhaps. Um, anyway, the, the, the England players who are at this batting camp are Alice Capsi obviously, Freya Kemp, Danny Gibson, Bess Heath, Emma Lamb and Sophia Dunkley. So when we talked about this, our concern was that John Lewis was going to be using this batting camp in a way to try to teach old dogs new tricks if I can put it in that way. But actually, it does look like he's done what we really hoped that he would, which is pursue a much more kind of youth policy. Um, so these are the players that he thinks that he needs to invest in very intensely over the next couple of years, because that's very important for their development. And obviously this boot camp is particularly thinking about how these batters are gonna play spin and how they're gonna do that in a better way. Um, so yeah. And with spin all the, on those, on those, those... Uh, subcontinental pitches exactly. as well. That's the crucial thing leading up to this world. The, well, the next two World Cups: yeah. World Cup in T Twenty World Cup of Bangladesh, and then a fifth year World Cup in India. So exactly. It's really important. So he has gone for um, this. Gives us quite an interesting insight into how he sees his England team shape, shaping up over the next couple of years. So I mean, obviously, everyone knows Alice Capsi is going to be a big part of that. That's not really any great surprise. But to have Freya Kemp in there, to have Danny Gibson in there have Bess Heath in there. These are the players of the future that he's convinced are, are important with the bat. So we've talked a bit about what Danny Gibson's role might be. Well, this is a batting boot camp, so she might currently be, her, her role might currently be more of a bowling all-rounder for England, but he wants her to develop her batting. And the same with Freya Kemp, actually. That's really interesting. Um, the Bess Heath, where we obviously saw her making her England debut right at the end of our summer, um, and against Sri Lanka and just having that one kind of quite quick fire hit out. Um, so he obviously wants her, her to develop. That's really exciting because it gives an indication that far from that being just a kind of throwaway cap and, oh, let's see how she goes, he actually genuinely is looking at her as being one of England's real exciting future batting prospects. Um, the, the Emma Lamb one is a bit more interesting 
um, because obviously she's still relatively young and, um, and you know, so it follows with that kind of more youthful policy. But I, I feel like for her, um, you know, the jury was out a little bit this summer in terms of where she sat in the, in the pecking yeah, order. Yeah, she hasn't really established her place yeah. in the England team, has she? But I mean, she's, yeah, she's not, she's not an old player, I don't think, but she's older than, she's old, the oldest of that group, She I is think. the oldest of that group. So, yeah. She's, and she has, I mean, she obviously, she's got an international hundred under her belt. She's obviously a very good player. Um, but I, my sense was just that a little bit, um, the jury was out a little bit and she's she perhaps She might been, have been being overtaken yeah, by those younger players. She's been but, fighting it out a little bit with my Boucher for that opening sport, hasn't she? And, um, so yeah that's that's interesting it gives an indication of where John Lewis's head is at he obviously thinks Emma Lamb is still very much worth focusing on and developing and of course Sophia Dunkley well she's had a, a bit of a, a difficult summer in some ways um, and this is perhaps partly about you know we didn't think that she was going to disappear she's, she certainly wasn't on the chopping block um, but this is about her re-establishing her confidence and so perhaps for her, it's partly about going, OK, um, I'm the coach and I think you're worth it and I think you're worth my investing this time in you. And also just a little bit of, of kind of time and space away from the intensity of um, possibly kind of Loughborough or other environments that she might otherwise have found herself in. Just to have that little bit of time to re-establish her confidence and get her game back to where it was a couple of years ago, perhaps. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a positive set of selections, yeah. and you know credit to John Lewis for trying something different. You know, you yeah. take the players out of their novel environment and put them in a different environment. We talked previously about the advantages of going to Mumbai that you can get plenty of you know plenty of keen young net bowlers that are going to give you lots of spin on some you know, in some dusty nets in Mumbai, and that's going to be you know incredible for these players' development. So you know, big up to John Lewis for kind of you know making this happen and for persuading the the powers that be because you know it won't have been cheap. That's why the pit yeah. has that be to you know find the budget for this. Yeah, I must admit, as I look out of the window at our dreary, um, rain-filled Friday, I, I am you know slightly envious of them out there in thirty-two degree heat. I'd be complaining it was too hot. <laughs> yeah, especially if you were having to be out there batting all day. <laughs> anyway, um, finally this week, Sid, um, something a little bit more serious because we actually had a comment on last week's episode from the Clanger. Our old friend, the Clanger. Hello, the Clanger. Um, I believe that's a pseudonym. We don't believe that's... He's that's, not actually a player. He doesn't actually on the His real identity. <laughs> anyway, I'll read out what he says. England are due to play Afghanistan in an ODI World Cup match on 15th of October. Should they, given they refuse to play South Africa over apartheid? Or is this a case of colour matters, but gender does not? Australia versus Afghanistan on 7th of November is even more interesting. Australia refused to play Afghanistan in an ODI series due in March this year. And Nick Hockley, um, the chief of Cricket Australia, stated basic human rights is not politics. I'm guessing therefore Australia will refuse to play Afghanistan. Is the reality that in cricket money comes first, then basic human rights? And if the above is true, what does that say about the moral standing of cricket? On the one hand, spouting off about the spirit of cricket as if it has virtue, whilst on the other, pouring money into and propping up gender discrimination. Couldn't have put it better myself, the clanger. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's very disappointing because yeah. basically you can see what's happened. The ICC have been breathing a big sigh of relief and going, we got away with that one. But, you know, nobody's making a fuss. No. Um, I, I will be amazed if the, these matches against the Afghanistan men's side don't go ahead. You know, it would yeah, have been flagged up already by those cricket talks. boards. If, yeah. if either Cricket Australia or the ECB were planning some kind of boycott, it would have been flagged yeah. up weeks ago. So, no, so those it's, matches it's will be It's incredibly disappointing that, yeah. that you know, everybody has abandoned the, the Afghanistan women. And you know, I, I, I wish it was different and I wish that we could do, do more. And, but I, I'm, I feel disappointed and I sort of feel a certain sense of responsibility because you know, we, we tried to make a fuss and... You know, we kind of, we went for an enormous splash in a very small puddle and that was all we kind of achieved. And it's like, is there something more that we could have done? But I'm not sure there is because, you know, we're fighting against an organisation that's that's driven by the whims of Indian politics and the BCCI and, um, you know... And the, driven, the, by, driven by an obsession with men's money, cricket. Money is king. Well, money, but... 
but men's cricket yeah. ultimately and I think that the clangers point about and you know we've talked about it previously about um, you know it's not okay to play apartheid South Africa because um, of like race discrimination but it is okay to play Afghanistan um, when there's kind of you know na national um, horrific treatment of women horrific sex discrimination going on and that's that's somehow okay um, so yeah you really are sending out that signal that that you're just accepting it and um, yeah it, it, it's very disappointing and particularly that obviously money talks but the ECB and Cricket Australia have got have got money to to splash around. They, you know, they they are two of the richest cricket boards in the world after the BCCI. They have the clout in world cricket to make a fuss about this. They could have and taken us down, and they chose not to, and it's very disappointing. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's a I bit mean, of a there's, downer. there's not much else to say really. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, on everybody. that <laughs> Thank you for tuning in, everybody, um, and we will see you, as ever, in a week's time. Bye for now. Bye.